One Saturday afternoon in November of 1990, a 26-year-old kindergarten teacher named Sue Lisha sat crying on a bench at a train station in the city of Naha, which is located in northeastern China. Sue had just left her husband for good. They'd had a bad marriage for a long time. It was very contentious. They fought all the time. And that morning, they had gotten into this major fight. And for Sue, it was kind of like the final straw. And so she just stormed into the bedroom, grabbed some things, threw it in a bag, and just stormed out. She was done. But Sue really didn't have a plan for what she was gonna do once she left the house. And so she found herself just sitting at this train station doing nothing, just staring at the trains, rolling in and out over and over again. And as she sat there, again, not knowing what she's gonna do, she suddenly took stock of the fact that very few people were getting on and off of these trains. And in fact, the train station itself was weirdly vacant. So the city of Naha, where Sue was, was actually fairly small by China's standards, even though there was 70,000 people that lived there. The city sat at the base of this towering mountain, and then all around the city in the outskirts was basically just farmland with lots of soy and corn crops. And then as you move closer to the city center, there were lots of things you would expect to see in a city like tall buildings and you know residential and commercial areas. But overall, Naha was just kind of boring. You know, it's like the city was a city, even if it was small, but there was just not much going on. And in fact, if you lived in China, China, but not in Naha, there was a very good chance you didn't know Naha even existed, like it was kind of irrelevant. However, in the last few months leading up to this moment that Sue is sitting at this train station, the city of Naha had suddenly been put on the map and everybody knew about this city because women from Naha were going missing in droves. In fact, Sue herself knew of at least a dozen women who had gone missing over the past few months from Naha. And as these women started going missing, it was making the news all over the country, and women who lived in Naha were acutely aware of the risks of being out alone, you know, in fear that somebody was gonna come snatch them up and take them away. In fact, every time Sue would go to work, she would make sure she would walk with other women, like in pairs, to ensure safety. I mean, this was a really scary time if you were a woman living in Naha. However, the caveat to the missing women was all of them to this point when Sue is sitting at the train station had been sex workers. And Sue, she thought, you know, in virtue of not being a sex worker and instead being a kindergarten teacher, that somehow she was not actually that vulnerable to being snatched up or, you know, whatever was happening to these women, she just felt like it wouldn't happen to her. But now as Sue sat at this train station, which again was eerily quiet and vacant, she couldn't help but feel like she had made a bad decision being here. She felt like she could easily become the next woman who went missing from Naha. And so Sue began to think, you know, maybe I should just go back home and try to patch things up with my husband, mostly for her safety, just to go back inside her home and be safe again. But before she could stand up to do that, she noticed on the other end of the platform, this man who was exceptionally well-dressed with this beautiful brown wool coat and fancy pants. He looked like he stepped straight out of a fashion magazine. He came up onto the train platform and without saying a word, he walked slowly down the platform all the way to where Sue was and he reached into his pocket and he held out a tissue to her because he saw she was crying. And Sue, she's looking up at the sky and again, there's nobody else here and she's very much on edge. And she doesn't know what to do. I mean, it was already creepy that this place was vacant, but it's even stranger to have a random man come up to her and try to initiate some sort of interaction with her. It just felt wrong and weird and very suspicious. But as Sue stared at this guy, trying to figure out what his angle was, she could see that he had kind of kept himself standing back from her, kind of a respectful distance, you know, not trying to crowd her out. And he was looking at her with a very sympathetic look on his face and he's holding this tissue out. And he said to her, are you okay? And he hands the tissue again, like, please take it. And there was just something about this guy that felt very sincere. And Sue kind of let her guard down and she accepted the tissue and wiped the tears from her eyes. She didn't say anything. And then this guy, he said, hey, do you mind if I sit with you? And at this point, Sue said, yeah, okay, you can sit down. And so this very handsome, well-dressed man took a seat next to Sue, not right next to her, again, respectful distance from her. And again, he asked her, you know, hey, are you doing okay? And for Sue, whose life had been basically miserable the last few months or even years with this terrible marriage she was in, you know, she wasn't used to being asked if she was okay. And this man, who she didn't know, had caught her at this very vulnerable moment in her life. And it was like all her emotions just came pouring out. And she began sobbing hysterically, telling this guy that no, she was not okay. Her life was in ruins. She had just abandoned her family and she had no idea what she was gonna do. And finally, Finally, when Sue stopped telling this guy all about her problems, she felt very embarrassed and kind of looked up at him like she was sorry for even saying as much. 
But the man, who was very intently listening, he was just nodding along, very sympathetic, and he told Sue that his name was Jia, Jia Wang, and that he was a director at a factory not far from here, and if she was open to it, he'd be happy to think about hiring her at the factory, you know, give her a new start potentially, because it seemed like that's what she really needed. And then he asked her if she wanted to come back to his house to discuss this job opportunity further. Now with this, even though Sue had really appreciated everything this guy had done to this point, the second he asked her to come back to his house, she's like, red flags are going up. She knew there's something off here. Clearly this guy does have an angle and it's not to benefit me. And so she looked at him with an absolutely suspicious look, like, no way am I going to your house. I don't know you. Like, I appreciate the tissue and you letting me cry, but there's no way. But again, as she's staring at him with the suspicious look, the look on Gia's face remained very sympathetic and very gentle, and it almost seemed like he was just gonna get up and go, like, hey, I'm sorry for offending you. But before he did get up to leave, Sue said, hold on, actually, yes, I'll come with you. She didn't know why she agreed to go with him. Maybe it was because her life was so messed up at this point that she was just kind of ready to take chances and be sort of reckless. And this was definitely that, big chance, very reckless. But again, she just felt like, you know, there's something sincere about this guy and she felt like she could trust him. And so Sue and Gia stood up and together they walked down the train platform, not saying much. They went downstairs, they went out to the street and they walked a couple of blocks to where Gia's street was. And as soon as they turned the corner and he showed Sue which house was his, Sue looked up and whatever hesitation she had had still to that point about following the stranger to his house were gone because she saw his house was beautiful. It wasn't that it was so grand or anything, it totally fit with the neighborhood, but it was very well maintained and totally felt on brand for a guy who was so well dressed and so well manicured and frankly so handsome. So Gia led the way to the front door of his house, he unlocked the door, he opened it up, and then he gently gestured for Sue to come on inside. And so she did, she walked past him, Gia followed her in, and the two of them took off their shoes and made their way into the kitchen where Gia brewed some tea for them, and then they both sat down and began to sip their tea and talk about this job opportunity. And so for a few minutes, you know, Gia is telling Sue all about the role and what she might be doing. And Sue is kind of asking general questions about it. But, you know, for the most part, she just kind of enjoyed being in the presence of somebody who seemed to care about her. But after she finished her entire glass of tea, suddenly Gia, who had been talking this whole time about the factory, just stopped. It was like he was waiting for her to drink that entire drink. And as soon as she was done with her cup, Gia, again, he went quiet and just stared at Sue with this kind of sinister look on his face, like he was very pleased with what was going on. And at that point, Sue looked down at her teacup and then back at Gia, then suddenly she began to feel very drowsy. It was like her vision was beginning to go and she realized Gia clearly had poisoned her. There was something inside of her tea. And so before she could do anything, everything went black. A couple of weeks later, just a few blocks away from where Sue met Gia at the train station, a police officer named Zhang was standing behind his desk at the police station when a very concerned looking elderly couple came inside. Now this couple was here to speak with Zhang about a missing person, but the missing person was not Sue. She had been missing for two weeks now, nobody had seen her, but no one had reported her missing. Her husband had just assumed that Sue had left him and that's why he hadn't seen her, and so he had naturally not reported that. And again, nobody else knew she was missing. So keep that in mind. Officer Zhang has no idea about Sue and Jia, none of it. But when this elderly couple came in to make a missing person report, Officer Zhang was not the least bit surprised. It was now December of 1990, and over the past six months, 20 women out of Naha had suddenly gone missing. Remember, Sue is not one of those 20. The 20 are mostly sex workers who went missing at that same train station where Sue met Jia. And so Officer Zhang was used to making all these missing person reports, but candidly, the police actually felt like, you know, because these were sex workers that were going missing, they weren't sure if they were actually being abducted or if they were simply getting on a train and kind of leaving town to go work somewhere else. And so really there wasn't a whole lot of investigation happening to figure out why so many of these women were going missing. But again, Officer Zhang, he's not surprised that they're telling him they wanna file a missing person report. But when Zhang took this elderly couple to an interview room to talk to them about whoever was missing in their lives, when this couple spoke, Officer Zhang knew this was different because the couple was not reporting another missing woman from Naha who also happened to be a sex worker. Instead, they were reporting that a man was missing, a businessman. However, the details of his disappearance sounded eerily similar to all these sex working women who had also gone missing. 
This guy was last seen at that same train station where Sue had met Jia, and then nobody had seen him, and so that's why they were here. And so Officer Zhang, he wrote up their report, and then he told the couple that, you know, very likely this man is okay, and he'll show up at some point under his own steam, but he told them the police would look into it, and they'd be in touch. However, as this couple got up and turned around and left, Officer Zhang couldn't help but feel like this missing man and all these missing women went missing from the same place. And it's the same city and it's the same pattern over and over again, but now we have a man. And even though Zhang wanted to write it off as an anomaly, he started to wonder if this missing man was connected to all these missing women. Because by January of 1991, so two months after Sue had gone missing without a trace and still had not been reported by anybody, and six weeks after that elderly couple reported that man missing, another five people from Naha had gone missing, two more women and three more men. And so now the police in Naha were looking at 26 people, men and women, that had all gone missing very recently out of Naha and nobody had a clue what happened to them. And importantly, because now there were men who were not sex workers who were going missing, the police couldn't just write this whole thing off as, oh, these sex working women are just going to another city to go do their work there. Like that was not a possibility anymore. Clearly something bad was happening and the police knew they really needed to do a real investigation here. So finally, in early spring of that year, the police in Naha formed a task unit and legitimately began investigating all these disappearances. But amazingly, there was like no information. Like there was nothing. These people went missing and nobody heard from them. There was no evidence of where they went. There was not even any sign that anything bad happened to them because no bodies had been found. There was no evidence of really anything happening. All the police knew is these 26 people, not including Sue, so she would be the 27th person, had been at this train station and then vanished. And that's all they knew. And it got to the point where this story really began to spread around China and it became like this running joke that if you don't want to live, go to Naha because everybody assumed there had to be some sort of serial killer or something happening there who was just roaming the streets, picking people off. By late summer of 1991, when really this story had taken hold across the country and was becoming a bigger and bigger deal because there was absolutely no resolution here, police had no idea what was going on, well, the whole situation got a whole lot worse because now, in addition to people suddenly vanishing at the train station in Naha, more people were also going missing in other cities nearby Naha, but all along the same train line that left out of Naha. So more train stations, more disappearances, all around the area, not just the city of Naha, but all around. And by the fall of that year, when over 30 people had gone missing all the same way from these train stations all around Naha, the police still had absolutely nothing to go on. All they had is, here are these people, here's where they were, they vanished, we got nothing else, no bodies, no evidence, nothing. But all that would change on October 22nd, 1991, roughly a year after Sue met Gia at the train station in Naha and then drank that drugged tea. On that October day in 1991, so again, a year after the disappearance of Sue, police at this train station, 1,700 miles away from the city of Naha, were doing random stops of commuters on the train platform. This had nothing to do with the ongoing investigation into all these missing people. This was just like public safety stuff where the police were kind of just walking around, looking for people who looked suspicious and then checking in on them to make sure they weren't doing anything illegal. And on this particular day at this train station far away from Naha, one of these officers spotted this very handsome guy in a beautiful brown wool coat and very fancy pants and shoes. And he stood out a lot because of frankly how beautiful he was. And so the police officer saw him and this very handsome guy looked up and he saw the police officer and it was like immediately he did something very suspicious. He reached down, grabbed a bag and quickly turned around and began walking away. And at the same time, two other people who were right near this very handsome guy did the same thing. They grabbed bags off the ground, quickly turned around, fell in line with this handsome guy and began quickly walking away from the police. And so the police obviously are totally suspicious. They run across the platform and they manage to stop all three of them and they turn them around and they say, show me your bags, open them up. And the police, they would open up these bags and they contain drugs. And so right away, these three know they are caught, but they don't say anything. They just stand there and they're totally silent as the police are asking them like, what are these drugs? Where are you going with these? What's going on here? They're not talking. And so finally the police go, give me your IDs right now. 
And so all three of them cough up their IDs, and the very handsome guy with the beautiful brown wool coat and fancy clothes, well, that was Jia Wang. The same Jia Wang who had gone with Sue into his house and given her the drugged tea. But again, these police officers are only concerned about the drugs. They don't know anything about these guys. They don't know that Gia met Sue and did this thing at his house with the tea. That wasn't even reported to police. Nobody knew about it. But these police knew they had caught these three people with these bags of illegal drugs. So they brought them back to the station and began to question each of them. And when they spoke to Gia, Gia said nothing. However, when they spoke to the two other people that were with Gia, one of them began to crack. It was obvious they had more to tell about these drugs and, you know, they were kind of holding back tears like they were very upset. And one of the interrogators, sensing one of these people was prepared to confess to something, instead of really drilling down on them, he was very comforting. And he offered them a blanket and said, here, you know, take this blanket, relax, it's okay. You can tell me what's on your mind, it's okay. And that just totally broke this person and they said, these drugs are nothing. You need to see what's in Gia's house. That will put these drugs to the side. They won't matter. What's in his house is horrible. The next day, a phone rang in the police station in Naha, and Officer Zhang picked it up, and it was one of the officers who interviewed these three people with drugs and got this whole horrible confession about what was inside of this guy Gia's house, and he told Zhang all about it. And as Zhang is listening to this, his eyes went wide because he knew this had to be connected to all these people going missing. Like, this has to be it. And so as soon as he hung up the phone, Officer Zhang rounded up 20 other police officers and 10 forensic doctors to go search Jia's house. And when they got there, the house from the outside looked just as beautiful as when Sue had seen it for the first time and felt like her reservations about Jia had gone down because of how wonderful his house looked. But as soon as all those police officers and the forensic doctors stepped inside of Jia's house, he wasn't home, there was nobody there. When they went inside, they were instantly hit with this horrible, horrible smell inside the house. Even though things are neat and beautiful inside too, there was something bad inside this house and the smell seemed to be coming from the basement. And so at some point, Officer Zhang and the other officers, they got to the door, they opened it up, and they looked down, and all they could see was just this dark room down there, and the smell was so strong, but they pulled their shirts up over their faces, and they went down the stairs, and when they got down there, they couldn't see anything, it's totally dark. But the smell at this point was so overpowering that a couple of the officers almost fainted. And so literally they had to leave the house fearing they were breathing in toxic chemicals or something. And they had to wear gas masks just to go back into the house and back down into the basement. And when they got back down there, now wearing their masks, it didn't seem like there was anything down there that could produce such an awful smell. Like there was just nothing down there. But eventually one of the officers moved to the middle of the basement, right in the middle. And they realized there was an opening and they looked down into it and they couldn't believe what they saw. And at the same time, somebody upstairs made an equally horrifying discovery because they discovered a videotape, a VHS cassette, that contained this horrible footage that effectively explained what was going on inside of that pit in the basement. But to understand that, we need to go back a year to when Sue met Gia at the train station. She went back to his house and drank the drug tea and blacked out. After Sue drank that tea, she didn't die. Gia did not kill her. Instead, she woke up a few hours later being totally confused and she was immediately hit by this horrible smell, but it was totally pitch black. She can't see anything. And she began feeling her hands around her and she felt stone everywhere she touched. And eventually she realized she was in what felt like the bottom of a well, but it wasn't water she was standing in. She was standing in something that almost felt like jelly and she began kind of touching it to figure out what it was. She could not tell, but she couldn't help but feel like the things around her were kind of moving, like they were alive. And then suddenly a lid that clearly sat atop of this pit began to slide over above her. And so suddenly light was coming down into this pit. And at first Sue looked up and she didn't see anything, but then she looked down and realized what was all around her. It was people, dead people, and potentially even half alive people that were just stuffed into this big pit that were all kind of decaying or, you know, slowly dying or whatever it was. And she's just standing amongst it all. And then she looks up and she sees it's Gia, the beautiful man who had brought her here. He's standing up there looking down at her with a smile on his face. And Sue immediately pleads with him to please spare me, don't kill me. And Gia, he looks down at her kind of inquisitively and he says, if I lift you out of there, will you do anything I tell you to do? And Sue said, yes, I'll do anything. Just get me out of here, please. 
And so Gia, he reached down, he grabbed Sue, and he pulled her up and out of this pit inside of his basement. A few days later, Sue was back at the train station where she had met Gia for the first time, but this time she was alone, and she walked up onto that train platform with no intention of riding a train. Instead, as soon as she got up there, she began looking around, and then she spotted a businessman who was sitting on a bench. And she walked over to him, and she sat down next to him, and we don't know exactly what she said, but we think what she said was something maybe sexually suggestive or, you know, something along those lines, and she's holding his shoulders and touching his hand. She doesn't know this man, and this man is very caught off guard by this, but he's kind of going along with it. And before long, she takes this businessman's hand, they stand up, and they walk out of the train station, down to the street, and they make their way a couple blocks over to Gia's house. And when they get there, Sue leads into the front door, she opens it up, she brings the man inside, the door shuts, they take their shoes off, and Sue leads this man into the kitchen, where Gia is waiting, with a wire between each hand, and as soon as this businessman walked into the kitchen, Gia pounced on him, wrapped the wire around his neck, and held it, until the man passed out, and then he released the wire. And then Gia and Sue took this man, they lifted him up, and they carried him down into the basement and laid him out on the floor. So he's not in the pit, he's just out in the middle of the basement floor. Then Gia stepped away, picked up a video camera, turned it on, and began to film. He was filming the man on the ground, and also Sue. And Sue, she knew what to do. She was going to do anything she was told to do. So she climbed on top of this still very much alive businessman who's just been knocked unconscious, and she straddles him so she's looking down at his head. Then she picks up a knife and she holds it in front of her. And then she looks up at Gia, who at this point has zoomed the camera in. She can hear the sound, the mechanics inside of the camera as it's zooming in on what she's about to do. And then she raises the knife over her head and drives it into this man's chest. The video that Gia shot of Sue murdering this man was the video police found on the first floor of the house shortly after police had found this horrible pit in Gia's basement. It would turn out that Gia Wang was absolutely the serial killer who was responsible for all these people going missing from the train stations. He would abduct them just like he did Sue and he would bring them to his house and then he would do horrible, horrible things to them and eventually he would chuck their bodies into this pit. And so when he abducted Sue, he actually thought that when he drugged her, that he had killed her and he had chucked her into the pit believing she was dead. But when Sue had woken up inside of that pit, when he opened it up and looked down and there she was fully alive, he had an idea. Well, why don't I turn Sue into a murderer like me? She can help me. And so that was the condition for her being pulled out of this pit, that she would assist him in murdering people and she agreed to do it. And so the reason the profile of victims changed from sex working women to random men is because those are the people that Sue went after. She began targeting men. And so when that elderly couple came in and reported to Officer Zhang that a man was missing, that was Sue's first victim, the man who had been seen on video being stabbed in the chest by Sue. Now, nobody to this day understands why Sue actually went along with this. Like she was pulled up out of the pit, but then when she was told to go to the train station and find your first victim, it's unclear why she didn't just go to the police and say, hey, there's a serial killer, Gia, here's his house, here's where he is, go get him. For some reason, she just did what he said. And in fact, Sue was not the only person who was brought in to this murdering scheme. He managed to convince three other people, including his ex-wife, to also commit murders for him. And all three of those people also had ample opportunity to flee and tell police, but they didn't. All of these people just did what Gia wanted without asking any questions. It was like he had absolute control over these people. That is, until that day in October of 1991, when those police officers doing a public safety check spotted Gia, along with two accomplices, fleeing with drugs. And they stopped them, and they got them back to the station, and one of his accomplices finally broke and told the truth. And the person who told the truth, the accomplice who broke, was Sue. She was there with him at the train station, nobody knew she was missing, and she was the one who, when offered a blanket and was told, you know, tell us the truth, she came clean. Ultimately, it was this police officer's kindness that broke her. In Gia's basement, inside of that horrible pit, right in the middle of it, were 42 bodies, 24 women and 18 men. In the end, Gia and all four of his forced accomplices, including Sue, were sentenced to death, and they were executed on January 24th, 1992. Today, the city of Naha is still just as infamous as it was in the 90s when these murders took place. And in fact, the nickname for Naha is now just Bandit City to reflect what happened there.
On a sunny afternoon in the summer of 1953, a young woman named Ann stood in the middle of a huge sugarcane grove in an isolated forest in Papua New Guinea. And around her were all her relatives and neighbors, and they were all there to mourn the loss of Ann's sister, whose name was Ton. She had passed away three days earlier from a very mysterious illness that people in Ann's village called Kuru. And in their language, the word Kuru meant trembling. Now, keep in mind, this particular mystery illness that was called Kuru only affected the people in An and Ton's village. This is like a hyper-specific illness that only happened inside of this little forest to these people. But An and the rest of the people in her village had seen this happen over and over and over again every year. And so they knew what happened when you got Kuru because it was always the same. As soon as you began to tremble, that was kind of like the first sign, one year or so after that moment, you lose control of all the muscles in your body until you die. And so in Ton's case, so Ann's sister, she had watched this happen exactly as it did for everybody else that ever got this illness. She started with the tremors, and then before long, she couldn't even stand up or walk around. And then finally, her sister lost control of the muscles in her throat, and so she couldn't eat despite being hungry. And so ultimately she died of starvation, which is like one of the worst ways to die. It's incredibly slow and very, very painful. And so ever since Ton's death three days earlier, the village had been performing all these rituals and prayers in an attempt to assist Ton's spirit on its way into the afterlife. And this type of very involved funeral was absolutely customary in An's culture. An and her family and all of these villagers were members of the Foray people, who were native to Papua New Guinea, which is an island just north of Australia. And in 1953, when the story is taking place, the Foray people numbered about 11,000 people. And remember, they live in a very isolated forest. They are basically cut off from the world for the most part. But they were beginning to fear that they were going to go extinct because of Kuru. Every year, the Foray people lost 200 people to Kuru. And for the most part, the victims were women, like disproportionately so, which made it even more likely that the Foray people would go extinct. Because if you lose all the women, you can't have any more kids. And in fact, by 1953, so many women had died from Kuru that by this point, there were three times as many men as there were women. In fact, the leading cause of death for Foray women was Kuru. But the Foray people did not view Kuru as just an illness. They actually viewed it as a curse. In fact, that was completely accepted that that is exactly what it was. This is not like getting the cold. Somebody did this to you, like a sorcerer somewhere, some unnamed sorcerer that's like coming into the forest is targeting these women and cursing them with Kuru. And so the Foray people put on these really elaborate funerals, mostly to ward off these dark magic sorcerers that were casting Kuru spells. And so the Foray people believed that if they just nailed the funeral procedure for somebody who has just died from Kuru, the kind of three day long, all these rituals and prayers they have to do, if the village is able to nail it perfectly, then the deceased who's passed away from Kuru, so in this case on Sister Ton, her spirit as a result of this perfect funeral would be able to kind of rise up and actually seek revenge on the sorcerer who killed the person. And so these funerals were basically like kind of taking the dead rising their spirit and sending them off to go kill the sorcerer. And so An and the rest of her villagers, they went through this very elaborate process for An's sister, Ton, and at the end of it, they did feel like they had really nailed it. And so they felt confident that Ton's spirit was going to rise up and get her revenge. A few weeks after An's sister's funeral, An was standing over an open fire and she was cooking some pork and sweet potatoes. And as she went to flip the meat over, she reached her hand out and she noticed her hand was trembling, which is the first sign of someone with Kuru. Now An told herself that, oh no, I don't have Kuru. It's just because I was working really hard today and I'm tired, like that's all it is. But she knew deep down she may have been cursed. An did her best to kind of hide her trembling hands However, after about a month from that first time she noticed her hand shaking, she noticed she wasn't really able to stand up without kind of losing her balance because her legs were starting to tremble. And finally, when she basically couldn't even stand up without assistance, this is again only one month after that first tremble, she knew she had Kuru. And An already knew that there was absolutely nothing anybody in her village could do to stop this from killing her. Kuru was a 100% death sentence. And so if you got Kuru, it's like the whole village just began prepping for your death because they had to be ready to do this big ritualistic funeral. And so imagine that you have this mystery illness or curse or whatever you want to think it is, 
and you're just counting down the days until you die. But for An, even though she had seen this happen so many times before and just kind of knew there's nothing she could do, she couldn't stand the idea of having this horrible, slow, painful death. And so she decided, you know what? I'm gonna do something drastic that basically nobody else had done before who had Kuru. So for context, at this time, the 4A people had been totally isolated from other people in the world for thousands of years. They basically lived in this little part of Papua New Guinea in the forest, and nobody else contacted them. They were totally isolated. However, starting in the 1950s, some Australian colonists and researchers and police actually began kind of making their way in and around the 4A people's area. So they were making contact, albeit not necessarily direct contact, but the 4A people were seeing basically white people wandering around in and around their forest from time to time. And it was always very shocking when they would see these people because they dressed completely differently, they looked totally different. I mean, it's like two worlds totally colliding. And generally speaking, Anne and the rest of the people in her village, they did not like having these Australian people kind of wandering around. But Anne is thinking, you know, the people in my village, the Foray people, they have no solutions for me. So maybe these Australian people that have kind of popped up, maybe they have some answers about what I can do to stop myself from dying from this horrible curse. Keep in mind, by going out and seeking help from these outsiders, it was like An would be breaking a huge custom. This is so taboo for the 4A people, and very likely, even if she was able to find a solution from these outsiders, it's not clear if she would have been welcomed back into her village. And so this is a truly desperate measure she's taking but she really felt like she had no choice. So even as her body trembled from Kuru, An managed to stand up using a stick and she began kind of hobbling her way quietly and discreetly out of her village, something that she really never did. And eventually after hobbling her way out of sight of the foray people, she began making her way through the woods and she eventually came to a clearing where there was this house. And it was obvious, this is not a house that the 4A people have built. This is somebody from the outside who's built something kind of near where they were living. And so An wandered up to this house, not really sure what to do, but she went up and knocked on the door. And a second later, it opened up. And it's this Australian anthropologist named Ronald Burnt, who actually An had seen before. He had been coming through her village a couple of times, attempting to interview people to learn more about the 4A people. She knew that nobody wanted to talk to him, but you know, she had seen him before. And so she was relieved. This is someone that I'm somewhat familiar with. And so as Ronald is staring back at her and Ronald's pretty tall and skinny, he's got glasses on, he's dressed like a typical Australian in the 1950s. And he's looking at Anne and Anne begins to try to tell him what's going on with her. And as she began to talk, the words she was saying were coming out all garbled. And she realized that the Kuru curse was now affecting her throat, the muscles in her neck, and she was not able to speak. But as it happened, Ronald, who was very familiar with the 4A people, he could tell, based on just the way she was acting and how desperate she looked, that very likely this woman was here because she believed she had Kuru. And Ronald, who had learned about Kuru after studying the 4A people, he had done some research on it, and he believed it was entirely psychosomatic, that this was not an actual illness. Basically, he believed Kuru was acute hysteria, that these 4A people were just going crazy and convincing themselves that they had this illness. And I guess that kind of manifested their death a year later. And so Ronald interrupted on, who again is struggling to talk, and he was able to communicate to her in her language that you do not have Kuru, you are hysterical, this is in your head, and you should go now. And then he shut the door on her. And An had no idea what to do. She was embarrassed. She was terrified that maybe somebody from her village had seen her come out here. And so just trembling and feeling so alone and so scared, she turned around and just went back to her village. Nine months later, An's condition had severely deteriorated. She basically was following exactly the process of every other person she had seen with Kuru. She had lost virtually all the control of her body. She could barely sip water. She was feeling absolutely horrible. I mean, she knew she was closing in on death and she had not gone back out to try to get help from outsiders. That interaction with Ronald had kind of destroyed her hope. And so she did go back and just was kind of waiting to die just like everybody else in her village did. But for Ann, the physical symptoms of Kuru that she was experiencing were undoubtedly terrible, but they were not as bad, at least to Ann, as the other side of Kuru. So in addition to referring to this curse as Kuru, which meant trembling, sometimes foray people would refer to this curse, this illness, as the laughing death. 
And it's because during the terminal stage, so the end stage of Kuru, when you're just about to die, you just begin laughing. It doesn't matter what you're thinking about. This is not an actual laugh. You're not thinking something's funny. It's like you could be weeping and totally depressed because you know you're gonna die, but you keep hysterically laughing, which makes your whole body sore from constantly laughing over and over again. And An was beginning to experience that. She would be weeping and laughing at the same time. And think about this, everybody else who's in the village, they know what this means. And so their preparations for her death are only getting more and more ramped up. They're getting ready for the big ritualistic funeral they're gonna give to An. And so An, as she's hysterically laughing, is fully aware that everybody's just waiting for her to die. And finally, just a few weeks after she had begun the laughing side of Kuru, on would pass away, almost exactly one year from when she first noticed the trembling in her hand when she was cooking over that fire. After An's death, more and more people just kept on getting Kuru. And over the next seven years, it was like clockwork. 200 plus 4A people died from Kuru every year and nobody had any idea how to stop it. It just became a part of their lives. And again, they kept getting closer and closer to being extinct. It was this really terrifying time. Seven years after An's death, so in 1961, a medical anthropologist named Shirley Lindenbaum was sitting in her office at City University in New York reading over old scientific articles. And as she was just kind of flipping through them, she noticed there was an article from an Australian anthropologist named Ronald Burnt, the same guy who had turned on away and told her, no, you don't have Kuru, that's not real, it's psychosomatic. And in this article, Ronald outlined these symptoms, these symptoms that the 4A people were exhibiting that obviously were not real. They had tremors, loss of muscle control, and huge mood swings. But Ronald was like, it's all in their head. It's not a real disease. But to Shirley, as she's reading this, she's thinking, why has Ronald decided this has to be psychosomatic? These symptoms seem like a real disease, like a neurological condition. Something must be attacking their brains, causing them to have these symptoms and then die. But when Shirley, just out of curiosity, began to do some additional research on the Kuru disease or whatever you want to call it, she discovered that there was basically no real research other than Ronald's about this weird illness. And so she decided, you know what, there's a gap in the research and I'm going to fill it. I'm going to figure out what's going on with the 4A people and this weird thing called Kuru. So the following summer, when Shirley finally had some time, she left New York and flew to Papua New Guinea and she made her way into the forest to contact the 4A people. And eventually she reached some of these small villages that contained 4A people and the 4A people, even if they didn't necessarily embrace Shirley, Many of them were open to at least speaking to her and talking about their culture, their customs, their history, and of course, talking about Kuru, this curse. And eventually, Shirley made her way into this one particular foray village where she actually saw a white man just walking around in this village. So he really stood out. And so immediately, Shirley walked up to this guy and he introduced himself as Dr. Michael Alpers. And he told Shirley he had been living in these villages with the foray people for several months because he was studying Kuru. He wanted to figure out, you know, what's actually causing it because he also felt very skeptical at the idea that this is just psychosomatic. That did not seem very plausible. And so Shirley and Dr. Alpers were totally aligned and they're like, hey, let's swap notes and do this together. And so Shirley began telling Dr. Alpers about what she had learned so far. And she said that when she showed up in Papua New Guinea, she believed what this was, what Kuru was, was a genetic brain disease, meaning it would be passed down from, you know, parent to child and so on and so forth. But she quickly discovered that after conducting research and talking to the 4A people in these villages, but that was not the case. This was not something that went from parent to child. Instead, Kuru appeared to spread amongst tight-knit social groups within these villages, which seemed to indicate this was actually a contagious disease, not a genetic one. And so she told Dr. Alpers that now her working theory was that Kuru was actually a contagious type of encephalitis, which is inflammation of the brain. But Shirley also said to Dr. Alpers that that did not explain why so many victims of Kuru were female. And Shirley also said to Dr. Alpers that, you know, I've been around loads of people with Kuru and I don't have it, so how can it be contagious? Dr. Alpers agreed with everything Shirley was saying and in fact had come to a similar conclusion himself, which meant he also had the same questions. Why only women and why wasn't he getting it? 
But he told Shirley that when he began trying to answer this question, he discovered that actually, in addition to lots of women getting Kuru, also lots of kids got Kuru. Not necessarily parent to child, but also children in these villages seem to be slightly more susceptible to getting Kuru than men. And in fact, Dr. Alpers told Shirley that right now there was a 12-year-old boy who was in the final stage of Kuru, so the laughing stage, the terminal stage, and because this boy's parents knew their son was going to die, they were so desperate and grief-stricken that when Dr. Alpers came by and offered to do an autopsy on their son when he passed to try to learn more, the parents agreed, even though that meant totally breaking for a custom. So this was like major taboo decision. But again, the 4A people are getting more and more desperate as they go closer and closer to the brink of extinction from Kuru. A few days later, Dr. Alpers found Shirley and he told her that the 12-year-old boy had passed away and so now it was time to conduct the autopsy. And so he led Shirley to a clearing in the woods that was kind of far away from the eyes of the villagers, and there was a makeshift autopsy table with this boy's body on it. And while Shirley really could not stand to watch this actually happen, she did go over after Dr. Alpers had opened up the boy's skull, revealing his brain. And he yelled to her, hey, you have to come over here and look at this. And so Shirley walked over and she looked down. And even though she had not seen a human brain before right in front of her, she knew right away there's something terribly wrong with that brain. His brain was completely shriveled up and covered in holes as if like a worm had drilled through his brain. And so Shirley and Dr. Alpers immediately knew this brain has to be sent off for further testing because something's happening here that's not psychosomatic. This is a real disease that is killing these people. About a year later, Shirley was back home in New York in her office when she received a letter from a research team at the United States National Institutes of Health, or NIH for short. And the NIH is one of the largest medical research facilities in the world. And it was where Shirley and Dr. Alpers had sent off that boy's brain for further study. And so by getting this letter, Shirley knew she was going to get information about whatever they discovered in this boy's brain. And so she ripped it open and pulled out the report and began reading. And the researchers said they had spent the last year, you know, studying this brain tissue. And while they still didn't really understand how Kuru even happened and what caused it, you know, was it a virus or an infection? They didn't know, but they had discovered something about how Kuru spread. During one of their experiments, the NIH researchers had injected some tissue from this boy's brain into a chimpanzee, and very quickly, that chimpanzee developed Kuru. And so this told the researchers that yes, Kuru was contagious, and it spread through infected brain tissue. But how one person's infected brain got into another person's brain was the big mystery. But at least they had found something. But as Shirley read this, because she had done all that research when she went into the forests of Papua New Guinea and spoke to all these 4A people, she had learned a lot about what they did on a day-to-day -day basis and you know what their various customs and rituals were. And she actually knew exactly how something like this could happen, something that only the 4A people were doing. During her research in Papua New Guinea, Shirley had learned that 4A people believe all humans have five distinct souls. There was that one soul that 4A people believe they could basically summon up out of a deceased person that would then go avenge that person's death. So think about how all those people who died from Kuru, you know, they believed that was a curse from some sorcerer. And so a big part of that funeral process was to call out that soul to go avenge their death, go find the sorcerer and kill them. But that was just one soul. There were four others. And of these four others, there was one called the Quila, which was the most dangerous. Quila meant flesh in the 4A people's language, and this soul was like a manifestation of death and decay, because that's what our flesh does. It just kind of gradually dies all the time. And so they looked at the flesh as being a really bad thing. And so they believed after someone died, their flesh needed to be stored properly. Otherwise, it would pollute the air and cause more death and decay for other people that were still alive. And the safest place, according to the 4A people, for the quila to be stored, so human flesh, was inside of a woman's body. And the reason for this is 4A people believe women's bodies are much more resilient than men's. And so if anybody could withstand holding quila inside of them, it would be the women. But there was a very specific process that the 4A women had to follow in order to kind of put this quila inside of themselves. And multiple 4A women had explained this totally bizarre process 
to Shirley when she was out there talking to the people in the village. The way it worked is a few days after a 4A member has passed away, this huge feast is prepared. Except the feast only consists of the quila. Basically, the person who is dead is chopped up and prepared by the women, like their entire body gets consumed. Now, keep in mind, anybody hearing about this who's not a member of the 4A people would be like, oh my god, that's horrible. But to 4A people, this ritualistic cannibalism was actually an act of love. The idea was by having these women consume the quila, consuming the dead person, you're protecting the living because you don't want the quila out and about polluting the air, and you are respecting the dead. But remember, Kuru got spread through infected brain tissue. And it just so happened that during these funeral feasts, when they were consuming the quila, the brain of the deceased person was an absolute delicacy. And so the brain was reserved for close female relatives of the deceased person. And so during An's sister's funeral, so when Ton passed, what do you think An ate? She ate Ton's brain. And then also, critically, Shirley had learned that a lot of these women who were given the brain, this delicacy during these funerals, they would often sneak little pieces of the brain and hand it out to kids as like a little treat. They would take the brain and eat it, you know, nobody knew. That's why the kids were also getting Kuru. And so a few years after this incredible discovery by Shirley about how Kuru was being passed along, the Australian colonial government banned the practice of ritualistic cannibalism in Papua New Guinea. Basically, they were telling the 4A people to stop eating the dead. It's what's killing you. And the 4A people, who were very desperate to stop being killed by Kuru, they took to it, stopped eating each other, and so Kuru was virtually eradicated, and the 4A population, instead of sliding towards extinction, actually began to grow really fast. And today, the total population has at least doubled. And also, just to close this out, one final note is it took until 1990 to actually figure out what was going on inside of these people's bodies when they had Kuru. Because back in the 60s, when they figured out how not to get Kuru, nobody understood what was even happening. It was just like, don't eat other people and you'll be okay, but that's all they knew. And while the process in the human body that caused Kuru remained a mystery for many decades after Shirley's big discovery, in the 1990s, researchers did finally figure out what's actually going on. Basically, somebody with Kuru has these proteins in their brain called prions that fold wrong into the wrong shape and then cannot function properly. This loss of protein function rapidly kills brain cells, which in turn shrivels up the brain and causes all those holes all over it. In the early morning hours before sunrise on April 12, 1990, a 31-year-old man named Nathan Neesmith pushed down on the gas throttle of the fishing boat that he was steering just off the coast of Georgia. And as he did this, he expected the boat to naturally kind of kick into a higher gear and go faster. But as he pushed that throttle down, nothing really happened, and the boat just kind of sputtered along, going about half the speed that he expected it to go. Confused, Nathan stepped away and began making his way out towards the deck where his younger brother, Billy Joe, who was actually the captain of this fishing boat, was out there taking a nap. And Nathan figured, you know, if there was any issue with the boat, Billy Joe was the guy to talk to. He would know how to fix it. Now, for context, the two brothers were on the first day of a seven-day fishing trip that actually Nathan was not supposed to be a part of. The crew was originally going to be Billy Joe, the captain, and the one who actually rented the boat, along with Billy Joe's nephew, and also two other commercial fishermen. But at the last second, those two other commercial fishermen had bowed out, and Nathan and a friend had volunteered to go to round out the crew. Now, Nathan and Billy Joe, they came from a fishing family, but it was really only Billy Joe who had pursued the family business. Now, Nathan was perfectly handy out on the water and did know how to fish and knew his way around a fishing boat, but compared to Billy Joe, there was a massive gap in experience. Billy Joe was the fisherman, and Nathan really was not. But Nathan and Billy Joe were very close, and so as soon as Nathan heard Billy Joe was in trouble and needed some more fishermen, Nathan didn't hesitate to say he would do it. Because really, for their entire lives, that was sort of their dynamic. Even though Nathan was the older brother, it was Nathan who looked up to Billy Joe, and any chance he got, he would do anything to help Billy Joe. And Billy Joe really respected that and loved that about Nathan. 
But now, as Nathan made his way out to the deck to wake his brother up to tell him on the first day of the trip, you know, right as Nathan's taking the wheel that something's wrong with the boat and I can't fix it. And also, Nathan was enormous, like 250 pounds, well over six feet tall. He was huge, this big physical presence, but he really was not mechanically savvy at all. And so again, Nathan is sort of feeling like, you know, sorry, and also maybe even second guessing whether or not it was even a good idea for him to have come along. You know, if he can't even fix a minor issue with the throttle, or the engine, you know, what's he doing here? But when Nathan woke up his younger brother and explained the issue, Billy Joe was not upset. He was like, okay, we'll go down below and we'll take a look at the engine and make sure everything is okay. However, when they went down and Billy Joe opened up this hatch to look at the engine, smoke immediately came out and it was very clear to Billy Joe anyways, that this was not like a minor issue. Something seriously was wrong with the engine. This was a big problem. And so Billy Joe began cussing, you know, he's totally frustrated. And he just told Nathan to, you know, go down below and tell the other two to wake up and come help. And so huge Nathan turned around and went down into the bunk room down below. And the second he got down to that level of the fishing boat, he just stopped because there was at least a foot of water in the hallway and in the bunk room when he went inside. And so Nathan screamed at the other two fishermen to get up. And so they got up and they're looking down, they're seeing all this water. And so they're starting to panic. And Nathan, he goes back upstairs and he yells to Billy Joe, who's dealing with this engine issue, that in addition to that, it appears the boat is also sinking. And so Billy Joe is like, get buckets, go down there and start bailing out the water. I'm gonna call Mayday. And so Billy Joe runs back up to the steering wheel. He grabs the radio and Nathan and the others can hear him yelling over and over again, Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. And as that was happening, Nathan and the other two fishermen put on their life vests, grabbed buckets and went down below to begin manually bailing out the water. But the second they got down there, it was very obvious the water, wherever it was leaking into the ship, was coming in way faster than they could potentially bail out. But they kept doing it, you know, getting the water out as fast as they could, trying to stay calm. They can hear Billy getting more and more frantic, yelling Mayday over and over again. And then all the lights inside of the ship began to flicker, and then they went out, and they were cast into total darkness. The engine basically had stopped, and it was just silence, just the sound of water rushing into this boat. Also, Billy Joe had stopped yelling Mayday because clearly the boat had lost power and the radio didn't work. And unfortunately, before the power cut out, nobody had heard any of Billy Joe's Mayday calls. So nobody knew where they were, nobody knew they were sinking, and without power, they had no way to communicate to anybody. They were totally alone. So Nathan, Billy Joe, and the others did the only thing they could do. They went up to the main deck, they grabbed their inflatable life raft, they blew it up, chucked it over the side, they grabbed as many supplies as they could, put it in the raft, they all made sure they had all their flotation on, and then they jumped into the life raft, abandoning the sinking fishing boat. Now, once all four men were safely inside of this life raft, they were not as panicked as you might think they would be because they had put enough food and water in this raft to last them at least several days. They all again had their life vests on, so proper flotation. And even though nobody responded to those Mayday calls, it wasn't impossible to think that maybe somebody had heard the Mayday calls and they just had not called back. You know, maybe there was a rescue operation coming to their location right now. They didn't know, but it felt plausible that they could be rescued. They would just need to kind of ration out their supplies and stay optimistic. However, their optimism quickly faded when after only being in this life raft for 30 minutes, right as the sun was starting to come up, Nathan began to hear a strange sound. It was coming from somewhere in the life raft. He couldn't quite place the sound. And so at first he kind of tried to ignore it, but then he noticed the life raft was becoming softer. And then he realized the sound he heard was a small hiss. The raft had a leak. And even though the four men were able to trace the sound of this leak to the actual puncture, they didn't have a patch kit or any meaningful way to patch up this hole. And so all they could do was just put their hands over this leak and do their best to seal it, but it didn't stop the air from coming out. It just delayed it. And so over the next hour, again, as the sun is just coming up on the second day of their big fishing trip, the raft finally completely deflated and all four men were suddenly bobbing in the freezing cold ocean surrounded by the wreckage of their sinking fishing boat. And so eventually the men grabbed the biggest piece of wood from the wreckage that came floating by and it was buoyant enough that it kind of served as like a makeshift raft 
but it wasn't buoyant enough to hold all four of them at once, which meant, you know, they had to take turns resting on this raft, and then they'd have to get back in the ocean and kind of wait their turn again. I mean, totally miserable. And as this was happening, they just stared at the hull of their sinking fishing boat that was still poking up out of the ocean, just drift farther and farther away from them because the current was pretty strong. And as they watched, their ship just kind of disappear into the distance, and they're just kind of drifting out into the middle of the ocean. They were all just stunned into silence. They could not believe how this had happened, and so quickly. And also, what were they going to do? I mean, they're in the worst possible situation here. It just didn't seem possible that they could actually survive this. Now, for reference, even though the men had salvaged a lot of their food and water from the sinking life raft, and they had their flotation devices on, that didn't protect them from hypothermia. It wouldn't matter if it was super warm outside. What mattered is the ocean was really cold. And because they couldn't stay on that raft, they had to keep cycling through, going back in the ocean over and over again. It was just a matter of time before they would get hypothermia. And sometimes hypothermia can kick in in just a couple of hours. I mean, we're not talking days here. This is going to be quick. And all these guys knew that. And so as these men were forced to have these really morbid discussions around who's going to stay in the water and who's going to stay on the raft, Nathan made a drastic decision. Nathan, being by far the biggest physically out of the four men, he knew that if he wasn't there right now, the other three could easily fit on their makeshift raft and stay out of the water, delaying hypothermia, thereby increasing the odds that they got rescued. And so Nathan did what he always did, and he turned to his younger brother, who he looked up to so much, who he just wanted to help all the time, and Nathan told him, I'm going to swim to the wreckage. I'm going to swim back to the hull of our sinking ship, and I'm going to fashion my own makeshift raft. That way you guys can have this one, and I'll have my own, and we can all get out of here in one piece. Now, keep in mind, it was fairly obvious that the hull of the sinking ship, which was barely visible near the horizon, was at least three miles away just from their own rough calculations. So this is a monster swim to get to that. And so immediately, Billy Joe and the other three were like, no, that is a suicide mission. You cannot do that. Do not swim to the hull. You're not going to make it. Now, just to give some additional context here, if you're not familiar with just how challenging swimming in the open ocean is, I'm going to give you my limited experience. So when I was in the military, we had to do one five and a half mile open ocean swim. And then also we did a whole bunch of two mile ocean swims. And even though we were allowed to use amazing wetsuits and fins, we had a swim partner with us. We had the land nearby to use as a reference to make sure we're going the right direction. We had food, we had water, we were in great shape. Even with all of that, open ocean swims are miserable. You get all the salt in your mouth and your nose. You start cramping and chafing. I mean, it takes hours and hours and hours to swim some of these distances, and you're constantly fighting against the waves. I mean, it is an absolute chore swimming in the open ocean, again, even with all the right stuff in place. And you got to remember, Nathan is this big guy. You know, he's got this big, bulky life vest on that's going to make it hard to swim. He doesn't have fins. He doesn't have a wetsuit. And he's got no landmarks around him, you know, to make sure he's going in a straight line. Typically, when you're swimming in the ocean, you're constantly looking at the land or some other landmark to make sure you're going in the right direction. He wouldn't have had that. And also it's this unknown distance he's covering and there could be predators in the water. I mean, there's so many barriers here that basically there was like a 0% chance this swim would be successful. But Nathan totally understood what he was really doing here. He didn't really know if he was actually going to make it to that boat. Frankly, that was not really the point. What he was really doing was choosing to sacrifice himself to potentially save his brother and the other two. And so even though they were telling him, do not go, do not swim in that direction, you're not going to make it, Nathan just turned to his brother Billy Joe and said, I love you. And then he turned and began swimming. And by some miracle, 11 hours later, right as the sun was setting, Nathan was still alive and still swimming, and he did reach the sinking boat that still had its hull poking out of the water. Now, when Nathan got to the sinking ship, he was almost dead from dehydration, from hypothermia. I mean, he's miserable, but he's made it to his destination completely against all odds, and he climbed up onto this hull, and he found a spot on the hull of the ship that supported his weight, and he managed to tie himself using some rope or maybe his life vest to the hull, so he was anchored in place, and then he didn't get to sleep because the whole time he's thinking, you know, this thing could sink under the water at any point and it will drag me with it because I'm tied to it, or he could just drift off of it if his rigging kind of came undone, if he was asleep. And so all night, beyond exhausted, he's just holding on to this hull. You know, not really sure what's going to happen, but here he is, just waiting it out. 
And then finally, when the sun came up that next morning, as Nathan looked around him, he's in the middle of the ocean, he sees in the direction he had come from, this pillar of smoke coming up over the horizon. And so Nathan, you know, he rubs his eyes, he can't believe it. He's thinking, there's no way, there's already a ship out here. You know, we're in the middle of nowhere. But sure enough, slowly but surely, this massive freighter ship came into view that was very far away. You know, it's not near Nathan, but he can see it clear as day and where the ship was basically circling was roughly where he believed his brother and the other two fishermen were still floating. And so he's thinking, oh my goodness, the freighter is going to save them and then it's going to come save me. And so Nathan just clung onto the hull and watched as this freighter made these big slow loops right around that same area. And then the freighter came to a full stop and it appeared to lower something down into the water. It seemed very much like a full-blown rescue operation. And then about three hours after he first spotted this freighter, the freighter began to move again and this time directly towards Nathan. Nathan was so relieved he could practically cry. But instead what he did is he thought, they're gonna be here in a minute. I'm finally just gonna close my eyes and go to sleep. And so he put his head down on the hull, looked one more time at the freighter and then closed his eyes. Now, Nathan would be rescued, but it would not be by that huge freighter ship. Nathan eventually had opened his eyes after closing them for a second, and he saw this freighter that had been coming straight for him at some point had kind of deviated and gone in the wrong direction and then vanished over the horizon, never to be seen again. And it would take three more days before a separate ship happened to find Nathan, they scooped him up, and they rescued him. But even though Nathan had been really crushed when that freighter had gone the wrong way, he held on to this idea that, you know, that freighter had clearly rescued his brother and the other two fishermen. And certainly, even if they couldn't find him, they would go back and they would tell the authorities that Nathan is out there. You know, we swam back to the hull of the ship. We got to go find him. And so certainly a rescue effort would be on the way. And it was true. A rescue boat had come out and found Nathan. So everything seemed to be tracking. And when Nathan woke up inside of his hospital room back on land, his friends and family were all by his bedside and he's looking around. He can't believe he survived. And the first thing he asks is, how's my brother? How are the other two fishermen? And why didn't that freighter pick me up too? And at this, all the people in the room just kind of looked at Nathan with a very confused look on their face. And eventually they asked him a question that made Nathan burst out in tears. They said, what freighter? It would turn out Billy Joe and the other two fishermen were still missing at this point, and nobody had heard a thing about some big freighter in the area. As far as anybody knew, at least in Nathan's family, that freighter ship did not exist. The search for Billy Joe and the remaining two crew members went on for weeks and weeks. And while the active search out in the ocean was going on, the Coast Guard and police were searching through every record they could possibly find of basically any ship that was even roughly in the area where Nathan and the others had been. But despite looking everywhere, there was basically no sign that any ship of any kind had been there beyond the rescue operation that eventually scooped up Nathan. And so again, it seemed very likely that that freighter ship didn't exist. And, you know, it was possible that Nathan in his very deteriorated state had maybe hallucinated it. Although Nathan was adamant, he definitely saw that ship. It did not feel like, you know, a multi-hour long hallucination. It felt like he was watching a ship. He was sure of it. But again, there was just no proof. And so nobody knew what to think of that. And then eventually, even though there was this huge search going on, there was just no sign of Billy Joe or the others. And so eventually the search was called off. And unfortunately, the presumption was Billy Joe and the other two were now dead. Five months later, on the afternoon of October 5th, 1990, the phone rang inside of Nathan's sister's home. Now, by this point, the victim's families had all tried to sort of restart their lives following this tragedy. But deep down, none of them could truly accept that Billy Joe and the other two fishermen were just gone. They just couldn't do it. It was too soon. It felt like, you know, any moment they were going to get news that, you know, they had been rescued by some freighter ship or something. And so any time a phone rang in any of these families' homes, it's like they would rush to the phone with the sense of hope that this time it's going to be different. Their loved ones are going to be okay only to obviously be crushed when that was not the case. But on this day, on October 5th, that phone call that came through in Nathan's sister's home, that one was different. When Nathan's mother picked up this phone call in Nathan's sister's home, she answered it and said hello, and right away she thought, oh, this has to be a wrong number, because the person who was calling was speaking in rapid Spanish, and she didn't understand what they were saying. But as she was about to hang up, the caller intermittently throughout their rapid Spanish began saying something in English that Nathan's mother could understand, and it totally shocked her. 
The caller kept saying Nathan's sister's name over and over again, followed by Nathan's sister's phone number, like on repeat, the name, the phone number in English over and over and over again. And Nathan's mom is so caught off guard by this that she just listened, not even sure what to do. And then before she could ask any follow-up questions, the caller cut the line and the phone call was over. And then a few minutes later, another phone rang in a home that was not far away from Nathan's sister's home. And this other home belonged to the boat owner who Billy Joe had rented the fishing boat from that unfortunately sank and caused this whole tragedy. And so this boat owner, he picks up the phone, he answers it. And just like the call that had come through in Nathan's sister's house, this call was the same. It was somebody calling, speaking rapid Spanish, and the boat owner was about to hang up when he heard something that he understood, because it was in English, and what he heard was his own name followed by his phone number over and over and over again. Basically the same type of call that Nathan's mom had just heard. And then before the boat owner could ask any questions, the line went dead. Now, one phone call like this, you could chalk up to maybe a prank or a wrong number or just a really weird coincidence, but to have those two calls happen within minutes of each other and basically take on the exact same form, but different names and different phone numbers, it just seemed way too coincidental to not be somehow connected to the missing fisherman because the link between these two households where these calls came in was the doomed fishing trip. And these calls did not stop. Every few weeks after this first time these calls came through, the phone would ring in Nathan's sister's house or in the boat owner's house, and it would be the same thing all over again. Rapid Spanish, followed by either Nathan's sister's name and then her phone number, or the boat owner's name and his phone number. Just like that for weeks and weeks and weeks. And so as soon as this started happening, Nathan's family and the boat owner, they figured out they were both getting these weird calls and they contacted authorities, which kind of restarted the search for Billy Joe and the missing fishermen, because now it seemed very plausible that maybe Nathan really had seen a freighter and that freighter really had picked up Billy Joe and the others. And, you know, maybe they had been taken to another country, a Spanish speaking country, and maybe people were trying to get in touch with the families now to get them back home. Or, of course, there could be a negative side to this, that maybe they were captured by some rogue vessel and were being held by these people who were calling. I mean, there's any number of theories, but it made authorities wonder, you know, hey, what's going on here? And so authorities got in touch with Mexican authorities and other Spanish-speaking country authorities and tried to figure out if there was any chance that there was, you know, a vessel out there around the time that Billy Joe and the others were missing that in theory could have maybe illegally been in that area or something. But despite this kind of exhaustive effort to kind of look again to see if maybe there was a freighter in that area, there was just no evidence that there was. It made no sense, but the authorities said, look, we have no idea what these calls are about. We still do not think that freighter or any ship that even resembled a freighter was out there. We still believe that Billy Joe and the others are dead. But as for the victims' families, they just didn't buy that. They really believed that these strange phone calls were somehow connected to Billy Joe and the missing fishermen. Specifically, these calls must signal that Billy Joe and the others were still alive. They just had no evidence to support that. That is, until March 6th, 1991, so almost a year after the doomed fishing vessel sank and Billy Joe and the others went missing, on that day, the phone rang inside of Nathan's sister's home, and she answered it, and it was the voice who spoke in rapid Spanish, but this time they spoke in perfect English, and all they said was, I'm bringing him home. And then the line went dead. And Nathan's sister screamed and she yelled for her husband to call police. They contacted the authorities. And again, it kind of brought back to life the search for Billy Joe and the missing fishermen. And then after this call, there was a near constant presence of authorities on the Georgia coastline, basically looking out to the water, waiting, hoping for Billy Joe and the others to return. But unfortunately, they never did. And following that last phone call where the caller spoke in perfect English and said, I'm bringing him home, after that, the call stopped. And so to this day, no one has ever been able to actually figure out what happened to Billy Joe and the other two fishermen. They are presumed dead at this point, but there's this one nagging question that surrounds the whole story, and that is, what did Nathan see? Was that actually a freighter picking up Billy Joe and the others? And if so, what did they do with them? Or was Nathan just hallucinating? It's entirely possible, but Nathan has always said he knows what he saw, and that was not a hallucination. As for the families of the victims, they still firmly believe that their loved ones are still out there and someday they will come back home and the families just hope they're alive long enough to be there for the reunion.
At around 5 p.m. on August 29, 1954, a 53-year-old woman named Juliet Exline had just sat down on her couch with a book inside of her home in Los Angeles when she got this weird wave of anxiety that kind of rushed over her. Now, there was nothing she could think of that would cause her to feel this way, and she even looked around her house thinking, you know, maybe there was something weird going on, but there was nothing. And so finally, Juliet, you know, she put her book down and just took a few calming breaths to kind of go back to normal. Like she didn't know what was going on, but she could tell she was super anxious. Now, generally speaking, Juliet was a very mellow person. She was not prone to anxiety attacks like this. And so that kind of caught her off guard. And the only thing she could think of that was different than normal was her husband, Larry, was on a much needed vacation. And so the last couple of days while he'd been gone had been maybe more lonely in the house. And so maybe that was causing her to feel this weird stress. She didn't know, but she told herself, you know, Larry's vacation was definitely a good thing. Larry was an exterminator, and over the past two years, he had not taken a single day off. He was a total workaholic, and so when Larry began to talk about wanting to take a break, Juliet had encouraged him to put in time for some vacation time, you know, put in a request. And Frank had actually done that, and as soon as his boss had approved a two-week-long vacation, Larry had been so pumped, he had called his friend, and they had immediately scheduled a fishing trip, and four days before, Frank and his friend had driven off to enjoy his time off. And so as Juliet thought about that, she told herself that, you know what, even if she was feeling a little bit anxious about Larry being gone, it really was a good thing for Larry, and it would improve not only his life, but her life as well. This was overall a good thing, and so she just needed to kind of deal with this anxiety that maybe or maybe not was connected to Larry. She didn't know. But for the rest of that evening, Juliet just could not get rid of this kind of baseline, low-level nervousness she was feeling. And so at some point, she began getting up and walking around her house and confirming all the windows were shut and locked and the doors were locked. She was drawing curtains, you know, checking in closets, making sure everything was totally safe. And then by 8 p.m., when she still just could not shake this anxiety, she decided she just needed to go to bed and kind of sleep this off. But after falling asleep, Juliet suddenly woke up at 10.15 p.m. drenched in sweat with the most intense anxiety she had ever felt in her life. And she was totally disoriented. She's looking around her room like, what's going on here? And then she heard a voice. It was Larry's voice, except he sounded funny. He sounded like quiet, as if maybe he was outside the house trying to come in and he was calling to her. And so kind of in a panic, she jumped out of bed, ran into the hallway, and right in the hallway was Larry. He wasn't outside. He was right there, except something was wrong with Larry. He was kind of hunched over and grabbing his stomach, and he, was, he had his hand on the wall, and he also appeared to be soaking wet. And so Juliet had no idea what was going on, but between all that anxiety and now seeing Larry here in this weird state, she couldn't help herself. She just ran towards him to just make sure he was okay. But as soon as she got about a foot away from him, he held out his hand and said, No, don't touch me. I have to go back. And what he said was so disorienting that Julia just stopped and stared at her husband like, what is this? And that's when she made the startling realization that Larry was not soaking wet with water. He was soaking wet with blood and he was clutching his stomach like something was bleeding in his midsection. And the reason he had sounded so quiet when he had called out to her and woken her up was because he was clearly hurt. And so Juliet has no clue what's going on. Like her husband was supposed to be seven hours away on this fishing trip. And so how is he here? It didn't make any sense. And so really not knowing what else to do, Juliet just said, I'm going to call the doctor. And so she ran past Larry, headed to the kitchen, and she was about to grab the phone on the wall. But before she could grab it, the phone began to ring. And so Juliet just answered it and said, hello, hello. And what she heard was the sound of a sheriff in Eli, Nevada. And he said, excuse me, is this Mrs. Exline, Juliet Exline? And she said, yes, what's going on? What's happened? And the sheriff said, ma'am, I'm sorry to tell you this, but I have some terrible news. Your husband got into a car accident and unfortunately he has passed away. And now the second the sheriff said this to Juliet, she just froze and goes, no, that's not possible. He's here with me right now. And Juliet turned around and looked into the hallway where Larry had been standing, and now Larry was gone. Larry really had died in that car accident because Juliet would bury her husband that week. But Juliet maintained that clearly after her husband had died, 
his spirit had somehow survived the accident because when she saw her husband standing in the hallway, you know, hunched over and covered in blood, it was at 10.15 p.m. She remembers because when she woke up, she saw the time. It was 10.15 and her husband had died at exactly 10.15 p.m., the exact moment she saw him in the hallway. Juliet would ultimately write an account of what she experienced with her husband. However, from that day forward, she never once saw her husband again. That was the only time. At 12.30 p.m. on March 7th, 2015, a police officer named Tyler Beddoes, along with his partner, were driving in his police cruiser near the Spanish Fork River in Utah, when suddenly a police dispatcher came on over the radio. And this dispatcher was speaking very urgently and said, hey, a fisherman has just called in to say that he spotted what looks like an upturned SUV partially submerged in the Spanish Fork River right underneath the bridge. And whoever is closest to this bridge, get over there and see if there's anybody inside the vehicle that can be saved. And so Officer Beddoes and his partner, they knew they were very near this bridge. And so immediately they banged a U-turn, they drove to the bridge, but from the road they looked down and couldn't see any SUV, but they saw there were some firefighters and paramedics that were also converging at the spot on the road and everybody's getting out and running down to the riverbank. And so Beddoes and his partner did the same thing. They got out and they ran down. And then finally, when they got to the riverbank and they saw underneath this bridge, Sure enough, there was this red SUV upturned, partially submerged, and he noticed right away that none of the doors had been opened in this SUV. And so it meant whoever was driving this vehicle when it flipped over very likely was still inside. And so Officer Beddoes and his partner and the other first responders just jumped into this icy cold river and began making their way closer and closer to this upturned SUV, which again, it's not fully submerged. It's like a third of the way underwater. So if you were sitting in the seat inside of this vehicle and you were an adult, your head would basically be in the water if you were still strapped into the seat. And as they're making their way towards this SUV, when they got close enough, they began hearing a woman inside of the vehicle screaming, hey, we're in here, come over here, help. But when Officer Beddoes and the rest of the first responders actually reached the SUV, the water was so murky and it basically completely covered up the windows that they weren't really able to look into the vehicle. They could just hear this woman yelling, but that was it. And then when they tried to open up the doors, they couldn't do it because the roof had begun to cave in. And so the actual framing of the door wouldn't open. And so all these first responders responders, it's like their adrenaline's pumping and they're like, come on, we got to push this thing up onto its side so we can get in. And so all these first responders are pushing and pushing and slowly but surely they began to raise the side of this vehicle up until the windows suddenly were clear and Officer Beddoes and the others were able to look into the car and they saw there was a woman in the driver's seat and there was a baby in a car seat dangling upside down in the back seat, still strapped in. And so Beddoes began screaming, there's a baby in here, there's a baby in here. And suddenly it was like everybody got extra strength and they pushed this vehicle all the way up onto its side. And then one of the firefighters climbed up onto the side of the car, which now was the highest point of the car. And he reached in and he clipped the straps holding the baby who had been upside down dangling there, cut the straps and pulled the baby out and handed the baby over to Officer Beddoes. And then the firefighter began doing the same thing to get the woman out. But Officer Beddoes at this point, he just took this baby, he turned away, he figured the first responders will handle this woman and he's gonna take this baby to safety because he couldn't even tell if the baby was alive or not. And so he's cradling this baby, he's rushing back through the water, back to the riverbank, and then he hands the baby over to the paramedics and right as he does, he sees this little baby begins to move its arms and flicker its eyes and he wanted to weep out of relief that this child was okay. They put the baby onto a stretcher, they put the baby in the ambulance and they whisked the baby away to the hospital where this baby would survive. But after the baby had been taken away, Officer Beddoes turned his attention back to the SUV and back to the woman to see how she was doing. But he could tell right away from the way people were acting, all the other first responders that were still dealing with the crisis in the water, the way they were acting indicated that something is off here. Well, it would turn out 14 hours earlier, so at around 10 p.m. the previous night, a 25-year-old woman named Jennifer Grossbeck had just left her father's house in Salem, Utah, and in her car was her little 18-month-old baby, Lily, who was in the back seat. And after Jennifer pulled away from her father's house and her father's on the porch waving to her, she began driving towards her home. But something happened around 10.30 p.m. that night 
We don't know what, but something caused Jennifer to careen off the road on that bridge and flip over and land in the water. Maybe she fell asleep at the wheel or an animal jumped out, we don't know, but we know at 10.30 she careens off the bridge and she lands in that river. And then for 14 hours, she and her baby remained upside down in that river until finally Officer Beddoes and the other first responders came rushing over to open it up and get them out of there. And if you recall, all the first responders, Officer Beddoes included, heard Jennifer screaming that they were in the car, come save us, please. But what they would find out is that could not have been Jennifer because Jennifer was killed on impact when the car fell into the water. Only Lily survived the crash, and then Lily, who's nearly hypothermic and she's upside down with water like two inches away from her head, for 14 hours she dangled there, and when she was pulled out, according to doctors, was like a couple of minutes before she would have died from hypothermia. And so without that voice, Lily almost certainly would have died because it was the sound of that voice that really encouraged all these first responders to find the strength and get that car up on its side and then get the baby out of there. We don't know whose voice that belonged to, but for sure, it saved Lily's life. And again, baby Lily would make a full recovery. And to this day, Officer Beddoes and the other first responders, they know what they heard and they do not have an explanation for it. At around 9 p.m. on October 26, 2009, a 19-year-old college student named Miyako Hiroka bagged up the last bit of trash inside of the ice cream parlor where she worked, and she dumped it into a bag, and she tied that bag up. It was closing time, and so Miyako looked around the inside of the parlor, made sure everything was where it was supposed to be, and then she flipped off the lights, threw her purse over her shoulder, she grabbed that bag of trash, she headed outside the parlor, she shut and locked the door, she dumped the trash in a nearby bin, and then began walking towards the exit of the mall which is where this parlor was located. It was inside of this big mall. Miyako went to school in a city called Hamada City, which is located on the coast of Japan in an area called the Shimane Prefecture. And Hamada City was a totally beautiful and very remote location with these amazing beaches and unbelievable mountains with all these ski resorts on it. I mean, this was an incredible place to live. But as much as Miyako did love living there, she was actually far more excited about where she'd be living the next year because she was doing an exchange program. She'd be studying in Russia, and that was so exciting for her. And in fact, this exchange program was the reason why Miyako had picked up this job at this ice cream parlor because she came from a family that was not poor by any means, but they didn't have a lot of extra income. And Miyako felt strongly that she really wanted to pay her way to go do this big Russian exchange program because it wasn't cheap. And so she was picking up as many shifts as she could to save up money to pay her way. And so Miyako eventually reached the exit of this mall and she stepped outside into the night and then she had a decision she needed to make and she needed to make this decision every night after work. There were two ways that she could get back to her dorm, which was located about a mile away. The quick way would be to just hop on a bus and have the bus take her to her dorm, but that cost money. And remember, Miyako is trying to save up as much money as she can to pay for Russia next year. And so taking the bus just felt like, you know, not really worth it. And the other option, which was free, was much longer and frankly, just plain spooky. And Miyako hated it. What it entailed was basically just walking to her dorm, but it would mean walking for about a third of a mile through this really spooky forest that looked like it was straight out of a horror movie. Now, up until recently, Miyako's coworker had always left with her at the same time and they lived roughly in the same area and so they would walk together through that forest you know saving money and also you know providing each other security as they went through the spooky area but recently the co-worker had quit and so now Miyako was all alone and so as Miyako stood there wondering what she should do you know take the bus route or take the forest route she just thought about you know next year it's all gonna be worth it I'm gonna go to Russia I'm gonna pay my way it's gonna be awesome and after all, what's the worst that can happen? It's just a few minutes walking through a forest I've done dozens of times. Before long, I'll be in my brightly lit safe dorm room studying away and everything will be fine. And so Miyako turned and began walking towards the forest. The following day, a little past 4 p.m., the owner of the ice cream shop where Miyako worked was standing inside the parlor feeling really annoyed because Miyako had not shown up for her shift, and now the owner, who normally did a lot of administrative and managerial things, was stuck at the counter serving all the customers, basically doing Miyako's job. But when 5 p.m. came, and still Miyako had not shown up, and the owner had tried calling her and she didn't pick up, and there was just no sign of her, the owner went from being annoyed to being somewhat worried. 
And so after, again, not being able to call Miyako to figure out what was going on, he wound up going through her file and finding her mother's phone number, and he called her. And when he spoke to Miyako's mother, he knew right away there was something wrong because Miyako's mother actually was pretty panicked. And she said, you know what? Last night when Miyako was coming home from work, she told me she would call me when she got to her dorm, but I never heard from her and I haven't been able to get in touch with her since. And so after this conversation ended, Miyako's mother would call the police and report her daughter missing. And pretty much instantly, the police in Hamada City responded in force. I mean, they launched a huge investigation to go figure out what happened to Miyako. And really the reason behind that is because Hamada City is this unbelievable place, this secluded, safe place, where things like this did not happen. And frankly, it scared everybody and they wanted to deal with it as quickly as possible. And so what police did at first is they went and looked at security footage from the ice cream parlor where they knew she had been working on the night she went missing. And sure enough, at about 9.16 p.m., there's footage of her walking out of the ice cream parlor in the mall. She's got a purse over her shoulder and you know she shuts and locks the door. She throws the trash away and then she heads towards the exit. But after that, nobody saw her. There was no more footage. There was no more tips or anything, she just vanished once she left the mall. And so very quickly, this story gained lots of attention because again, Hamada City is like this quintessential vacation spot. It's so perfect, it's so safe. And to have this girl just go missing, it was scandalous. And so it made the news all over Hamada City. And also people who lived in Hamada City were suddenly on edge at night. You know, what's out there snatching people up? In fact, Miyako's college, during the few days following her disappearance, they set a curfew for all their students. Like all their students had to be back in their dorms at a certain time to keep them safe. But again, despite the police really leaning into this case from the jump and putting all their manpower and all their resources into this, they really had no idea what happened to Miyako. Then on November 6th, 2009, so 11 days after Miyako went missing, a man who was hunting for mushrooms up on this mountainside about 15 miles away from the ice cream parlor, believed he spotted this beautiful mushroom sitting underneath a few fallen leaves. And so excited, the guy runs over and he begins moving away the leaves to grab this big meaty mushroom. But as soon as he grabbed the skin of this mushroom and began to pull, he stopped. And then he quickly turned and began sprinting back down the path that had brought him up here. And as he was running, he pulled his phone out and he saw he had no service and he just kept on running and holding the phone up, looking for service. And then finally, when he was about halfway down the mountain, he saw he had service in his phone and he called the police. And the second the dispatcher answered, this man began screaming, I found a human head. When police arrived on that mountainside where this man claimed to have found a human head, well, they confirmed he was right. They found Miyako's severed head right underneath those leaves. And the reason this guy thought her head was a mushroom, a dark colored mushroom, because it was obvious that Miyako's face had been so badly beaten and it was all black and blue before she lost her head. And so this mushroom hunter had literally thought that was a big, big mushroom. And so at this point, the Hamada City Police shifted their area of search from around the mall and the ice cream parlor where they thought they would find Miyako to this forested mountain area where her head was found. And now, of course, it was no longer a search and rescue. It was a recovery mission. They're just looking for the rest of Miyako's body. And over the next couple of days, as police searched this forested mountainside, they would find different parts of Miyako all over the place. And then after they had found, you know, all the pieces to Miyako, the running theory based on what they were seeing is that very likely she had been strangled to death and then her body was burned and then she was dismembered and scattered throughout this forested mountain area. But there was very little evidence about who had actually done this to Miyako. Miyako had no enemies to speak of. Everybody who spoke about Miyako said she was incredibly lovely and kind, and really there wasn't anybody in her life that would want to do her harm. And also because Miyako's body had been destroyed and left out for so long, any trace evidence left behind by her killer or killers was basically non-existent. And so the police really had no leads to speak of. They had no suspects or anything. And so they called in psychologists to try to make, you know, a profile of who they thought might have done this. And the best theory anyone could come up with was that this had been a random crime of opportunity, that the person who killed her didn't know her, and that likely her killer was a man who was likely between the ages of 20 and 40. But even that information really didn't narrow anything down. And so quickly, this case began to go cold. 
But as the police investigation itself began to go cold, the kind of lore around the story was only growing. I mean, this really seemed like a totally unbelievable case considering where it happened. I mean, Hamada City is like this perfect place. How could this happen here? And so what started as being kind of a local news story, albeit a big local news story, became a major national story all over Japan. And so all these TV outlets and journalists were descending on Hamada City, and they were taking video of the ice cream parlor and of the police department and filming, you know, Miyako's dorm and her school and her parents' house. I mean, there were people all over the place trying to get any bit of information to report on about this case. And despite there being dozens and dozens of these live reports basically every day coming out of Hamada City about this case and about Miyako, there was one particular news report that took this case from being, you know, totally unfortunate and sad and tragic and horrible to completely unbelievable and bizarre. Shortly after Miyako's remains had basically all been found, but they were still doing some recovery operations up on that mountainside, one of these kind of random TV reporters who was in Hamada City to report on this crazy case decided to set up their TV camera so it was pointing towards the dark entrance of that spooky forest that Miyako would walk through to get back to her dorm. And so this TV news reporter's got their microphone and, you know, they're standing with the forest entrance right behind them and the cameraman's filming, you know, looking towards this opening of the forest. And the actual report was pretty generic. I mean, this reporter was basically saying, well, we're coming at you live from Hamada City, just outside of the forest where perhaps Miyako was killed. And it was just like that. It was just kind of talking about the case and there was nothing to it, at least not to the TV reporter and the cameraman who were on site. Because for them, the entire report was pretty routine. They did their job, they got their shot, they got their report, and then they left. But they streamed it live. So while they were doing it, all these people are tuned in watching this news report live in front of this forest and something really unsettling happened on this broadcast while that news reporter was talking another voice began to be heard by people watching this broadcast and it was not the cameraman and it was certainly not the tv journalist it was a woman's voice and there was no woman anywhere near the shot and after the fact the journalist and the cameraman would also attest that there was nobody around, it was just them. But this detached, very pained voice said very clearly, and all these people heard it live, this is very painful. Why only me? And so after this news report happened, this story, this case about Miyako, went from being just a Japanese story to being like an international sensation. Because everybody believed when they saw this video that that voice that was heard was Miyako's ghost, basically talking on camera. That's why you can't see her. It's her spirit communicating with the living world. However, despite that drawing even more attention to this case, it didn't remotely help the police actually solve the case. They still had no idea who did this. And that's how this case would stay for years, just totally stalled. That is until seven years later, when a police officer was conducting a routine police review of old criminal case files that hadn't been solved, you know, going through them all to see if maybe evidence had been missed and maybe that was why the case had not been solved. And so this police officer is looking through all these case files and when they landed on the Miyako case, they did discover a piece of evidence that had been totally overlooked. It was the file of a convicted sex offender named Yoshiharu Yano. Yoshiharu was a 33-year-old man who had served time in prison for assaults on three different women in Tokyo, which is 500 miles away from Yamada City where Miyako was killed. And because of that 500-mile gap between Tokyo and Hamada City, Yoshiharu had been completely overlooked in terms of being a suspect in Miyako's murder. It just seemed like he was too far away to be involved. But the police officer who was doing that routine review, they discovered that right before Miyako was murdered, this Yoshiharu guy had been let out of prison and decided to live in Hamada City. And on the night Miyako was killed when she decided to walk into that forest, well, they found security footage of Yoshiharu's car driving along around that forest and up near that mountain where Miyako's remains were all discovered. And so this investigator who discovered this piece of information got permission from higher ups to search Yoshiharu's home where he was living right then. And when they searched his home, they discovered a digital camera with 40 photos on it that would explain what happened to Miyako. It was very clear 
Yoshiharu had murdered Miyako because some of the pictures contain photos of Miyako and they are just horrible. But figuring out who Miyako's killer was was not the end of this case. In fact, it wasn't even the most shocking part of this case. The most shocking part of this case is what happened to Miyako's killer, Yoshiharu, basically right after she was murdered and that voice, that detached female voice, was heard on that TV news report. Seven years earlier, right around the time that Miyako's head had been found, and also after that voice had been heard on the TV newscast, some people who were driving in a car north of Hamada City began calling the police to report something very strange. They called the police and said, there is this small white Toyota Corolla car that has two people inside of it, and they've driven to the side of the road and the driver is ramming over and over again against the railing. Like they're smashing into the railing, backing up, smashing over and over again. Like the car is somehow in control. They don't understand how these people are not getting out of the car. Like what are they doing? Traffic had stopped on either side. It was just totally nonsensical. And then by the time the police showed up, this car that was just repeatedly driving into the side of this guardrail, it burst into flames with the two people inside still clearly alive and looking terrified, and they caught on fire and died. Now, at the time, this did make the news. It looked very much like some sort of weird murder-suicide where the driver had intentionally, you know, driven the car until it burst into flames and killed themselves and also their passenger. But it didn't really amount to more than just a really weird news story because there was no connection to the Miyako case. This is like a totally isolated thing. However, seven years later, when that police officer discovered the link that Yoshiharu was in Hamada City, and then they figured out, yep, Yoshiharu was the killer, well, suddenly, that totally weird murder-suicide took on a whole new meaning. Because the driver of that car was Yoshiharu, and the passenger was his mother. And again, from eyewitness testimony, it didn't really make sense the way this all happened. It was almost like the car was possessed or something, that, you know, the passengers couldn't control it. Now. Who knows if that's true, but when you combine it with the sound of that female voice on the TV news camera that everybody assumed was Miyako's ghost saying, this is so painful, why only me? Suddenly those words took on a new meaning. People thought, you know what it is? Miyako's ghost must have taken control of that car and made sure not only Yoshiharu suffered and died, but his family member died as well, that she was seeking her revenge on her killer. As promised, here is a clip from the newest episode of the Bedtime Stories podcast. Enjoy. Despite the invention of satellite communications and GPS tracking, ships and planes continue to vanish from across the globe leaving no trace of their passing. Simultaneously, the remains of mysterious boats wash up on remote shorelines, their identities long since removed by the effects of weathering and decay. It has been theorized that there are places on this earth where time operates in a somewhat different manner, where some invisible portal or corridor is capable of propelling a vehicle and its occupants to a very different moment in history, both in the future and the past. Could it be that this outlandish theory is the reason behind some of the inexplicable disappearances that take place on a near daily basis? Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed that clip, be sure to go follow and binge the Bedtime Stories podcast on whichever podcast platform you listen to. New episodes come out every Wednesday.
So that's going to do it. I hope you enjoyed today's stories. If you want to hear more strange, dark, and mysterious stories, remember we have a whole slew of podcasts under the Ballin Studios bannerhead. Just search for Ballin Studios on any podcast platform and you will have hundreds and hundreds